Starting off the news this week, a study has been published in the journal Nature that has detailed the observation of the effect of gravity on antimatter. The research was conducted by physicists at CERN, the organisation that runs the Large Hadron Collider, and is another aspect of Einstein's general theory of relativity that has now been proved through experimentation. The researchers used anti-hydrogen atoms and observed them acting in a manner that is consistent with the gravitational forces exerted by our planet. The paper has therefore ruled out the effect of anti-gravity, at least in this case. You may be wondering why this experiment has only just been carried out, as antimatter has been manufactured in the past. Antimatter is incredibly difficult to experiment upon. Firstly, it is incredibly difficult to create, but even once scientists have passed that hurdle, antimatter is incredibly difficult to manage, because it is destroyed as soon as it comes into contact with matter in a process called annihilation. Previous experiments on antimatter have suggested that it does indeed behave, as one would expect, in the same way as matter around gravity. It is only this paper, however, that has directly observed these effects and ruled out other possibilities for how gravity affects antimatter. So, a great step forward in understanding one of the more mysterious aspects of our universe. With every milestone like this, we get ever closer to filling in the gaps in our knowledge about particle physics. In other news, new evidence has been found of a major solar storm that hit planet Earth 14,300 years ago. Researchers from the University of Leeds published their findings in the journal Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society A, and made this discovery by analysing cross-sections of sub-fossil tree trunks preserved in the banks of the Drosette River in southern France. A massive spike in the amount of radiocarbon in the rings formed 14,300 years ago was a major clue to this hypothesis. By comparing these spikes to the record of beryllium present in Greenland ice, it was concluded that there was indeed an extremely large solar energetic particle event at that time. Only nine such extreme storms have been known to have happened in the last 15,000 years, and none of them after the Industrial Revolution. Of course, if such a storm were to impact Earth today, there would be grave impacts for our much more technologically focused world. And so, understanding these events is of great importance. We do not yet have a complete understanding of our Sun, but studies such as these help fill in the gaps of our knowledge. This study does in fact look to speculate on the possible causes of this extreme solar event, including a suggestion that this event, and a less extreme but longer lasting one that happens a few hundred years later, happened during a Maunder type solar minimum, meaning a period of time where sunspot activity was at an all-time low. Up next in the news for this week is a very intriguing study that has looked at animals' responses to hearing human voices. This paper, titled Fear of the Human Super Predator Pervades the South African Savannah, documents the outcome of an experiment performed in the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa, in which automated camera and speaker systems played various sounds near watering holes and recorded the responses of animals to hearing them. These sounds included the playbacks of human voices, lions, sounds from hunting including dogs and gunshots, and control sounds such as birds. Incredibly, overall, the fear responses of the animals to sounds of humans were significantly greater than those they displayed when lion sounds were played out. Out of the over 4,000 independent trials, the animals were twice as likely to run when hearing human compared to lions, and left watering holes 40% faster when hearing human voices. Some of the species that ran from human sounds significantly more than from lions included giraffes, leopards, hyenas, zebras, kudu, impala, and warthogs, and rhinos and elephants were particularly fast to abandon water holes when hearing humans. The study therefore explains how their results are consistent with a lot of other evidence, suggesting that wildlife across the planet are much more fearful of humans than any other predator. This undoubtedly will have significant ecological impacts and may also be a challenge for conservation tourism. However, it might provide some new opportunities to protect species in other cases. 
definitely a fascinating result and an important insight into how modern animals have adapted to the presence of humans. Also in the news, a recent study conducted by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has found that many marine mammals living in the western North Atlantic Ocean, Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean Sea are under threat from warming ocean temperatures, rising sea levels and decreasing sea ice volumes associated with climate change. Researchers looked at 100 stocks of different American marine mammal species. A stock is a group of individuals of the same species found in the same geographical area that will interbreed with each other when they are mature. Of these 100 stocks, they found that 72% of them are highly or very highly vulnerable to climate change, with a little less than half falling in the very high category. Tooth whales were found to be at a high risk to climate change, whilst large baleen whales, such as humpbacks and North Atlantic right whales, were among the most vulnerable. The scientists looked at the animal's degree of exposure to climate change and sensitivity and their capacity to adapt to it. The problem is that the warming ocean alters the ability for marine mammals to find food and reduces their amount of suitable habitat. Changes to ocean temperature and chemistry can also change sound transmission, which can affect echolocating marine mammals such as dolphins, which use it to communicate and hunt. It is hoped that this research will help inform the National Marine Fisheries Service on the best way to manage and protect these marine mammals in the era of climate change. First up in the paleontology news is a paper naming a new genus and species of dinosaur from China. Named Qianglong Shouhu, it comes from early Jurassic Age rocks and is based on a collection of three adult skeletons as well as five clutches of eggs that contain embryos. Some pretty exceptional finds. It's a kind of dinosaur called a sauropodomorph, related to the famous long-necked sauropod dinosaurs and has many unique features of the skeleton that show this to be a new species. Since so many eggs from this dinosaur have been discovered, some very interesting insights into the reproductive biology of these animals could be gained. Changlong has quite big eggs that had thick, calcareous shells compared to other sauropodomorphs, and the pre-hatching posture of the embryos themselves was somewhat intermediate between the posture seen in crocodilians and in modern birds. Additionally, all the embryos that were found had similar degrees of bone ossification and were similar in size, indicating that they likely all hatch synchronously in this colonial nesting site. Interestingly, these eggs were also leathery in texture, leading the paleontologists to conclude that dinosaurs as a whole started off with leathery eggshells, based on their ancestral state reconstruction analyses. Although a few other instances of early sauropodomorph eggs have been found, their morphology has been controversial, and based on this new discovery, it seems that they are likely all leathery, in contrast to being soft-shelled or hard-shelled. It was then early along the theropod lineage that major changes in egg morphology occurred, instead of later on towards the origins of birds themselves. An amazing new dinosaur discovery there then, showing how complex the evolution of the reproductive biology of these animals was. Also in the paleontology news, there's been a very interesting study looking at the mammals and their relatives that survived mass extinction events. The paper explains that it had long been thought that small-bodied generalist feeders were the ones left over after a mass extinction event, and that larger and more specialised lineages evolved from these survivors. However, in this new paper, the paleontologists constructed an absolutely huge evolutionary tree of 1,888 different species of synapsid, the larger grouping that mammals belong to, including things such as Gorgonopsians, Dimetrodon, and many others, to compare the characteristics of the diet and body size of these animals from the Carboniferous period all the way to the Eocene, across several mass extinctions. As it turns out, the idea of unspecialised species surviving wasn't quite always the case, as there were instances, such as the mammals that survived after the non-avian dinosaurs died out, where the survivors actually had novel, more specialised features of the teeth that allowed them to feed on a wider variety of food once other animals had gone extinct. It also turns out 
that a small body size was only established as an ancestral state of new radiations among mammaliforms in the late Triassic. And before then, it hadn't always been from very small lineages that new radiations of diversity began. So another fascinating paper that shows the survival of lineages after extinctions is much more complicated than we had realised. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and as always, we'll see you on Sunday.